Every organization across the world, big or small, has a way of sharing information. Today, we're going to be studying just how easy it is for a hacker to break in and steal your data. Hello guys, welcome to Bullhack Academy. I'm Costa. Let's begin. Today, we're going to be talking about NFS and SMB. NFS stands for Network File System and SMB stands for System Message Block. Both of those protocols are used for sharing files and data across the organization. Let's say that you're working in a company and you want to have a place on your file system where every document or file that you upload to it other colleagues of yours can access it instantaneously. That's a shared drive. Usually this is running because of those specific protocols. So NFS on Linux predominantly used and SMB predominantly used on Windows allow for easily sharing information across the organization without you knowing it or it doesn't really matter if you know it or not. It happens. Today we're going to be studying how we are going to enumerate those protocols and how we're going to use tools to generally, I'm sorry, not generally, but specifically exploit those protocols to break into a system. And let's see what type of access can we get from then on. And we're also going to be studying a little bit of privilege escalation because once we're into the system, then what? Talking about stealing information. So let's begin. All right, guys, as you can see, I have established VPN connection towards the box that I'm going to exploit or attack. And I have created a file, a directory, where I'm going to store all files uh, for that specific box. I have named it with shares and it's located in my home directory. Let's begin with um, simple nmap scan. Let's do a service version scan save scripts let's make it verbose let's increase a little bit the speed and output all the data into shares file we've got a lot of output as you can see we have discovered four open ports we have an ftp uh, file transfer protocol we have a http service running but let's focus on the today's topic, which is NFS sharing and RPC bind. RPC, which stands for Remote Procedure Call, is a protocol that makes it possible for NFS to do its job. It makes it easier for different protocols to basically do their job as expected. So let's continue our enumeration. And by the way, I would like to showcase another scanner that I often used. It's quite easy. It's much faster than Nmap in some cases. The name of the file of the binary is Rust scan, and it works as so. U limit is something that the scan requires for it to run in a more optimized way. U limit, and then I believe dash a and the IP of our target and then we can specify nmap commands so we can run rust scan to discover open ports and then for those open ports we can specify nmap scan commands for example we can run service scan and um, generally everything that nmap can do we can do it with rust scan it's more enhanced as you can see we have already discovered those op open ports and it's not just four. And now the script has since it discovered all open ports. Now it's running nmap with really verbose output. Here you can see the command. And it specifies all the discovered ports, the IP of the target, and we're running service version scan on IP 172, etc. And uh, let's scroll down. We have Again, FTP, HTTP, we have discovered RPC bind, which is running on port 111. Here, well, we see NFS on uh, port 2049, but as you can see, it's not that descriptive, let's say. Let's say we would like to better understand what RPC is running. We can do that with RPC info. 
and there it is. We have discovered a little bit more information about the NFS that is running on two ports, one UDP and one TCP. We have mount D and port mapper. We don't really uh, need to know about those for now. We have to focus on NFS. Nmap also supports multiple enumeration scripts because Nmap has scripting language into itself, built into its configuration. So we can see all scripts that are for NFS, for example, by typing ls to list all files within user, share, nmap scripts and NFS. It should be the default configuration for yourself as well. We can see that there are three scripts for nmap and we can run those like so. For example, script equals NFS and with a wildcard it's going to execute all those three scripts. Let's see the output. Um, I had to specify the port but uh, it's not that bad in this case. So what information can we extract from the scripts that already run? The first script shows us that there is a home directory and that home directory is for the user Amir. Amir home directory is mounted on that file share. The second script, which is called show mount, discovered that this file share can be mounted locally on our computer or in this case on any computer because it's wildcard as you can see so anyone can mount this specific file system and the third script already did that for us it mounted that file share which is the home directory of Amir and it listed all files within that directory and as, as we can see generally the same um, the usual files that any Unix system has in the home directory. Bash history, we have some um, cache directory, profile directory, Vim information, etc. There are also alternative ways we can access those um, that type of information. Let's say that we don't want to use Nmap, we can also use directly show mount and uh, the IP and as you can see we have that information here from the second script. Now that we know that there is a home directory, let's mount it on our local computer. So mount no look. I'm not sure, is it two, perhaps one? Let's see. The target is NFS protocol. We have the IP and then we specify the home directory and the user Amir. And then we have to specify where exactly on our local machine we want to mount that directory. So let's do it on mount. It can be across the entire file system. I would like it to be on mount. And yes, it should be with one. Okay. An incorrect mount option was specified. Hmm. No lock. There it is, okay. All right, guys, now that I have copied IDRSA on my local machine, I would like to, let's, let's see the contents of it. As expected, we have a private key, but this private key cannot be cracked by John in its current state. It has to be converted into something that John can understand. So we can use the SSH to John to convert that private key into a hash. Let's see how it looks like. Okay, so we can see that the format is SSH. So let's change that to SSH. Okay, and loaded one password hash. That was quick. Go to root, John, and then cut the pot and as we can see the cracked password is hello6 let's copy that ah come on yeah that can be quite annoying first let's change the name of the IDRSA from back to just simply IDRSA 
let's change the privileges of that file to 600 because since this file is used for authentication SSH is quite picky it's not going to accept this file with wrong privileges it needs to be specifically owned and only by the current user which is root okay now that we have done that we can also check IDRSA that we see that yes it is correctly changed now we can use SSH and specify IDRSA file and then Amir which is the user that we uh, have his IDRSA file and then the IP address of his machine and now Amir is located at that IP address so let's try to connect ah and as we can see port 22 connection refused that is because it's not running on that specific port uh, let's go back and that is why also why it's really important yes it's really important for you to keep note something that I did not do now I have to check the port again and discover on what specific port is running the service SSH as you can see here we don't have port 22 open and we have three services that are unknown I can do additional enumeration to see where SSH is running or I can just type the port and just see manually since we have only three ports you know it's not that bad and this is the correct port and the passphrase it is hello6 as we uh, already cracked the password and now we are locked as a mirror onto the system yes it's really that simple so let's see again this is the home directory nothing that we don't really know let's see what privileges since this uh, is it in the sudoers file so this specific user actually it's not Amir it is Amy Amy can run PK exec and Python with no password using sudo so this is interesting this is definitely a vulnerability and let's see what we can do with that information we can go to git get the gtfo bins which means something but uh, youtube doesn't like it let's uh, type python 3 or, or just python and as we can see we have already a binary called python and within this website we can look for binaries and basically see how we can use that specific binary to use it to escalate our privileges to further compromise the system to get root in this case we're going to try to elevate our privileges from Amir to Amy and see what happens next as Amir I have limited access to the file system that is why we want to do that okay so we can create a reverse shell we can uh, upload download files we can write read or we can spawn a shell which which is something that I would like to do let's copy that so I'm copying this specific command which tells Python to import os commands and then run shell let's get back to the terminal this is something interesting from Amir we can do the following we can run commands and impersonate Amy as so dash u to specify user then Amy and then we would like to specify the full path name towards the binary which is user bin python3 and then C well I paste I can just paste that and save up some time dash C import those commands and spawn shell let's see what happens who am I? I'm Amy so from Amir I elevated my privileges to Amy let's see what Amy can do oh Amy can run SSH with sudo and it requires no password let's repeat that process let's go to that website gtfo beans 
type in SSH, go to that binary and see what we can do. Already in the beginning, we see that we can spawn interactive shell through proxy command. Proxy command is uh, some type of an operation that, that's allowed from SSH. And uh, as we can see, let's analyze it a bit. Proxy command begins with, a, with an empty command and then we use semicolon as we saw in our previous video how we can concatenate different commands. We're using semicolon to concatenate a second command and use sh which is a shell similar to bash to redirect standard input and standard output to error. So both the input and the output is redirected to the error stream. Both are going to be presented whenever there is an error. And what we can see next is that, okay, now that command is run and it ends with an X. Why? Because we're running SSH and we're trying to connect to X. That is something that does not exist. So we're not connecting to a real machine. It's going to provoke errors and all errors are going to be displayed on the screen, which is the input and the output. And this is how we can basically do the following. sudo ssh o I'm going to press enter and there we are. Who am I? I'm root. Why? Because we run that specific command ssh with root privileges and it requires no password. So it's that simple. Now, if I would like to steal any sensitive data for that matter, I can simply do it and nothing can stop me, nothing. From a beginner's point of view, this might look quite confusing, quite, um, quite hard, but believe me, once you get the hang of it, that's uh, really not that hard. So hopefully you have learned something new. And from a business perspective, please, please check your configuration. <laughs> this is actually seen in the wild. It is possible to see that type of configuration in the wild. So a hacker could easily break into your systems and steal all the shared data within that file shared space. Thank you guys for staying until the end, for learning something new, for being passionate just as I am. Press the like if you enjoyed the content, subscribe to our channel and see you in our next video.